I just want to call out uh, Guy Davis, who's the uh, production designer. And uh, Scott Gershon, who is our uh, sound designer. Alexandre Desplat. And uh, the co-director with, uh, with Guillermo, uh, Mark Gustafson. And my, my dear friend, Guillermo Del Toro. team for this, this beautiful, heartwarming and heart-wrenching film and to hear it from, from them directly, uh, how they did it and their, their interactive dynamics creatively. So I'm just going to plunge right in. I was told to start with the far end, but I'm going to start with my pal, uh, my, 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 my great and dear friend Guillermo. And maybe you can just talk for a second about your a creative dynamic with Mark and how I've never co I've never co-directed a film. How do you yeah. how do you do that? What was the, the interaction? Well, the beauty in animation is that it actually is the wise thing to do. Number one, and it's the endeavor was so enormous, and it was uh, I think that neither of us separately could have handled the whole uh, film. It was gigantic from design from the beginning, I, uh, writing the screenplay and all that. All that I, I can I can do because I've done it a number of times. But Mark and I looked at the the an amount of days we ended up shooting about almost a thousand days, wow. and we looked at the the normal unit number in a movie is thirty animated movie thirty thirty one units. We went to about sixty or over sixty units shooting at the same time. So we would we would launch uh, we first of all. Once we were green, that we went through the pre-production together, and I could be physically there. Yeah. We started shooting, and as you know, in, in animation, you start with one unit, then it's two, then it's four, then it, it, they keep multiplying, because each of the units is gonna have a Geppetto, a Pinocchio, a double Geppetto, a triple Geppetto, a quadruple Pinocchio. Uh, we have to repeat sets and all that. And then COVID struck, mm -hmm. and everybody started interacting through Zoom. So it was all natural from then on. We launched every shot of the film together. Two of you. By Zoom, yeah. We would launch it by Zoom, and then Mark was physically important, and I would open uh, the files in the morning like a kid at Christmas. <laughs> and I would go, let's see what, and, and I would be either very grumpy or very nice. <laughs> and, uh, but we had a sort of a brain, uh, brain melt on our styles and taste, what would you say? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Fortunately, I mean, you don't know that going in. You're like, our, our... Were you trepidatious because he's Guillermo del Toro? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> Still, <laughs> yeah, no, we speak. Yeah, no, that was, uh, you know you have to raise your game. You, you, you have to do your best work because his filmography speaks for itself. But I think what was exciting for me about, one of the things that was exciting about working with Guillermo is when you have someone like him on your project, he's gonna guard the gates. You're not gonna get notes. Uh, we're gonna make decisions. You're talking about studio. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Fuck that and there was. <laughs> I'm just saying better myself. <laughs> we talk like that in the, in the business. <laughs> And there were there were no test screenings whatsoever, nothing like that. And uh, so, you know, to the extent that it would either succeed or fail, it was based on you know uh, our choices. And we're to, yeah. Woo! Yeah. And that, the reason for that, which I learned from a dear friend of mine, <laughs> you know, the reason for that is ultimately one of the goals of there were two goals significant to this movie. One. We, uh, Mark and I very conscientiously made this the animators, 
in this movie and the crew to stop the idea that this is a boys' club. 45% of, of, of the crew was female. Yeah, we, we, made, we gave the animators, some of the female animators, their first shot at key animation, and they absolutely killed it. Yeah, definitely. And we, we, uh, we actually found a bunch of, well, I should go back. We shot this in Portland at um, Shadow Machine. And Which if the Taliban wants to blow up stop motion, they would absolutely. only put one bomb there. That's it. <laughs> Because Don't that's where Leica is there in Portland, and, and Wendell and Wild, uh, Henry Slack's film, was shooting at the exact same time as us. So we had the biggest concentration of stop motion animators ever collected in one place. In the universe. Yeah. yeah. But, but the, other, the other two things where we, I wanted part of the movie to be animated by Mexican animators in Mexico. And we did it. And where were they? That's the city? In Guadalajara, man. Guadalajara. <laughs> and the final part, which is very important, is... And you were there touching the moving the puppets? No, no, no. I touch them now. <laughs> like they know, but I saw you backstage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but uh, the, uh, the final one was to tell the animators, you are actors. We said that first day of shoot, you're actors, you're going to be treated like actors, and you're going to be credited like actors. And they're credited right before even the boys cast on the main trailer. Okay. And when we, when we were briefing them, we always said, look, this is what we need. This is, this is what the character is thinking and feeling. Here's the marks that they need to hit. But you, once that curtain closes and it's just you in there for a couple days or a couple weeks, it's your shot. If you see an opportunity, take it because we really wanted the animators to have ownership of this stuff. So an animator would follow a character yeah. and another animator would follow another character? As much as possible. Yeah. yeah. And did you find that there were certain people that excelled at certain characters? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. We found our Geppettos. We had like three animators who were exceedingly good at Geppetto and we had our Pinocchios. And we also found that- Different Pinocchios. Yeah, different Pinocchios. We, had, we found that people were, you know, obviously better at action scenes or, or some people were better at the emotional stuff. So the, there's um, the scene, uh, there's the, the scene in the bedroom where uh, Geppetto is putting mm. Pinocchio to bed and oh, Carlo uh, to bed. Yeah. One animator was in that tiny bedroom set for two years. Oh what? Yeah. Same with Death and Pinocchio. This Brazilian animator, Tiago, came from sunny Brazil and was kept in that limbo for two years, fed Cheetos and fed him under the He came from Zamba and... Uh, oh. Well, the, the directors could rock out all night, but let's talk to, to a guy about the sets. I, I'm told there were 99 sets. So how do you approach production of that? I imagine in its initial stage, it's not that different from a, from a typical full-scale build, but then what happens after that? Yeah, I mean, design-wise, we, we tackle almost everything the same as like live action. Because I've worked with Guillermo for like about, I think, 13 years now on, on different live action and oh. some traditional yeah. you know, animation. And uh, the process was basically the same, except like now, um, Pinocchio, I was joined by uh, Kurt Enderley, who was also the uh, production designer with me. And his expertise was stop motion because he had worked on Isle of Dogs and I think uh, some others that he's going to remind me afterwards that I forgot to name. But <laughs> he, uh, he had the practical experience of stop motion. So I could work with Guillermo on the concept and the design and then he could bring it to fruition. We have our art director Rob Dessou in the building at did you work in, in CG and 3D design, or, or were you sketching? With I know I know Guillermo puts a lot of you know emphasis I, on, on I, the wrist because I get to give the art. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the toy. Yeah, so I want shit for my house. You need another house <laughs> next to your other house. Yeah. But what we did is reference everything from photographic. I said no, none of us is gonna draw a whimsy fucking building. We gotta make it real. Because if Pinocchio lands, it needs to land in the exact period. We, we researched what graffiti was being used for Mussolini at what year, blah, blah, blah. Everything was based on reality. Because Pinocchio should be the only anomaly and anything connected to him. Right. So well, let's talk about that for a second. You made a bold choice, which you were telling me backstage, actually prevented the film from getting made for a long time, which is to set it in fascist Italy, 
in, I'm assuming, the, the early 40s. Yeah, late 30s, late 30s early 40s, right? Um, um, and and um, what was your thinking on that? Was it because it was ultimately a story about about someone who's disobedient, so you needed a rule set yeah. framework? Yeah, that was the, the I said, if the puppet is, the puppet is gonna be disobedient, what better frame to fight against than that? And also I wanted to say, here you have somebody instructing his kid not to lie and obeying a fascist regime, which is pure lie. You know, and, and, and it, it was very clear to me that this movie was not gonna be about Pinocchio changing, but Geppetto changing. Right. So Pinocchio was not gonna learn to be a real boy. This guy was gonna real, learn to be a real father, right. which is far more important. Yeah. Kids, are, kids are born right. Parents fuck them up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have one other director to director question. So this is obviously about father and son and-, and This is being recorded. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> Parents ruin them. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, did you, because you wrote the script. Uh, with Patrick know, McHale? Yeah, yeah, who, who you've collaborated with. Yeah, and, beautiful guy, man. Yeah. So, did you approach it, I mean, how much of it was you writing as a misunderstood son of a father, or how much of it was you writing as a father? on the quest to understand your own children. 50-50. Yeah. <laughs> because, because the thing is, the worst reviews you'll ever get are from your kids. Tell me. Yeah. Five. <laughs> you know, and, and, and you get them, and the, the, unlike the critics, you know your kids are right. <laughs> <laughs> no, they can't be wrong, because they didn't imagine all that. So, you know, I learned to, to see my father as a human being before he passed away of the ship of water, and I learned to realize that I had lived my, my parenting life as me, but I was a father, I was that figure, and I, I started to, to train myself to live to that, and that's why, to me, the journey is incredibly moving for him to say, I love you exactly as you are, and you don't have to change. You know, it's, it, I always hated, I hated Beauty and the Beast, that I learned to love the beast, and all of a sudden this boring guy from GQ comes out. And I go, who is that motherfucker? <laughs> Same with Pinocchio. Family show, buddy, family show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> who is that man? Who is that man now? <laughs> well, I want to circle back a little bit on the, on the origin of this for you, because I've known you, we've been pals for 33 years, and I've known this has been on your mind for a long time. But first I want to ask uh, Alexandre, about the uh, about the score, mm -hmm. and yeah. this is your second collaboration. Genius. It, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how did you how did you approach it thematically, and because uh, obviously it's a very very different score than the than the last one yeah. you guys did. Well, you know, I think we share with uh, with Guillermo a um, what I call a joyous melancholy. Um, and, and his Pinocchio is just made of that. It's, it's the joy of the father finding a, a child, or loving a child, the love and the joy of, of the little boy, wooden boy, dis, uh, discovering a new father. It's all these things, and, and you can't, you could not on this, on this uh, film follow just one track. There's so many emotions going on. And of course, what you just said about the father and son relationship as a, as a young boy, uh, the father, and um, as the years go by, you you live with the father. You, sometimes you hate, sometimes you love, and and everything is there in the film. And uh, it's a if the inspiration has to come from somewhere, it starts there. It starts with the the core of the film, and then there's all this social and political content that's so strong. Um, and then there's uh, the genius of uh, of Guillermo now Guillermo writing, and 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 the depth of every. You know, it's just—it's not just one story. There's so many layers that it's—it's it's it's easy. It's easy to work on that. You know, do you do you compose at the the piano or do you do do you synth? Uh, how do you play for him? What you're what you're I, coming I up with? I do a bit of everything. A bit of piano when it's a melody, and then, and then orchestrate on the on the keyboard so we can hear all the instruments and uh, to picture. Yes. And and the songs. Talk to me about the songs. Uh, how did how did that how did you develop them? Well, did you uh, intend to do so? Yeah, yeah. On, on the beginning, we we contacted Nick Cave, and then later we contacted Beck, mm -hmm. 
and I was really geeking out because I, I was meeting rock stars, but they are really, really hard to schedule a lunch with. So I said to Alexander, look, I'm available, I'm cheap. And uh, we started composing, and I did the lyrics for the, my song, the, the, the lullaby, and that was successful. After that, uh, I proved to be not as talented as we thought. So, you know, we, we laid the, between Patrick McHale, myself, Alexander, and, and Mark, when we were in Paris, we laid a few of the words, and then him and Katz, uh, who he had, who he wrote a big success summer song in Paris called My Boat, Bon Bateau. And then they had composed together, and, and Katz came and made the lyrics be what they are, really, as beautiful as they are. I wrote the ideas. But your plan was always to have, how many yes. songs are there in the film, five or six? Eight. 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 And, but the idea was the first half, this came from Patrick McHale, he said the first half they sing, and the second half is fascist music. You know, and, and, and the, the thing that is very beautiful is we wanted to tell you it's not a regular Broadway show, so when the cricket goes for the showstopper, he gets crushed. Right? Yes, <laughs> every time. Yeah, I wish there was more of that in movies myself, personally. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, the, and, the, 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 sorry, and the fun of, of, the, uh, of having all these songs, we have to record uh, in advance, of course, very, very early on for the animation to be able to, to be done by this gentleman. And uh, uh, by having the songs early, we could use some of the elements of the song, some motifs, and use it in the score. So that it's not just a song, score, song, no, everything is kind of interweaving. And, uh, and it helps, I think, the, the continuity of, of emotions. And we have great singers. And the singers are the actors, which is also very rare. Very often, actors are, you know, they're replaced by a real singer in a studio. Here, Ewan McGregor is singing, Crystal Waltz is singing, Gregory Mann, the little boy who plays Pinocchio, is singing. So it's, it, it makes also um, something very real and kind of organic to the film. Yeah, he had a beautiful falsetto kind of voice. He had, is the thing. Yeah. 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 We, we shot, we we shot for so long. He did not look <laughs> like Ernest Borna. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but also, the score was done all with wooden instruments. Alexander said, why don't we use only wooden instruments? And so everything in the, in the score is made of wood. Well, let me talk to you. Yeah. So let me talk to, to Scott about the, the, the sound design because obviously you're creating the, the movement, the body movement throughout an entire film of a character who's made out of wood. And I'm, sh I'm sure you could just clack some pieces of wood together and hard cut it, but you must have done something more organic than, than that. Yeah, you know, when we first started, Guillermo and I were talking about vintage puppets. So we started collecting vintage puppets and saying, yeah, because let's go down the obvious path. Uh, we started realizing they're pretty hard and they didn't have the fragility. And then what we started, what I started realizing as I started seeing scenes from storyboards to, to shots, all of a sudden I started seeing emotion. And I'm realizing the sounds that they need to use for wood need to have an emotional content, not just banging wood. And uh, I kind of- So to speak, <laughs> it's a family show. <laughs> You know, just turned into a Cialis commercial. Yeah. <laughs> so we cut a lot of wood, but the problem was it was a lot of wood clapping. <laughs> You're just digging deeper, buddy. Yeah, you know. <laughs> no, I get that, but did you, did you actually use uh, kind of integrated systems of, of like bodies that you could... You could Absolutely. We started really creating uh, not only wood, but metals and rubber and just different elements. So we wanted to give it where, if it was just wood, it would be annoying, to be honest. And we did that. And we was like, okay, this isn't gonna work. So we looked at all the little squeaks and all the little things and, and really pitch bend them and really gave them a personality. So like in the scene where Pinocchio's got the, the glove on the nose, he goes ee, 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 just to try to give that, I'm sorry, you know, kind of feel with sounds. Mm -hmm. So the whole point of it was not to just do sound effects. The whole point is to take sounds and trans, uh, transcend it into an emotional feeling. Uh, whether it's the dogfish making it big or the voice treatment we did on the forest sprites, we wanted to just give it a, a feel and really support the detail, the amazing emotions, and just give it that feel. And the other part we did was, which I thought was kind of unique, which I hadn't done in a movie, is the mixes designed. 
So it's not just sound effects and do the mix and do our thing. It was at the beginning, Guillermo goes, I want to create a puppet show. So we did it mono. And we, you know, we wanted to show the birth and the innocence of Pinocchio. And then as he started growing, we spatially opened it up. So now all of a sudden, as he evolved in the complexities of society, then we got into Atmos and we started making it bigger, bigger, bigger. And then at the end is the beginning of life as the end of life. We simplified it again. Mm, interesting. And, and there was a whole design concept, uh, whether from the design to the mix of the whole arc of the show. So sometimes people say, what's the favorite scene? And I'm like, the whole show. You can't break it into a scene. Well, you must have, sorry, you must have been at your spatial peak when you were inside the dogfish Absolutely. environment, right? So there was stuff crumbling and coming from everywhere. You, you know, may I say this because I, we, I've never told you this. Everything I know, I learned or uh, thought about mixing, I learned with you when you were mixing the laser disc of the abyss. You remember? Yeah, no, I came I to visit every day, yeah, yeah. and one day you moved the crane, a crane in the in the cargo area. You did, and for me it was like, and you were speaking about space and how you have to little by little put the audience into a fishbowl of sound. And 30 years later, here I am. Yeah, and you've, yeah. And you've, you've yeah. done it masterfully so many times. But, but I wanted to tell you, we never said, we never said, you. We, you don't bring me flowers, we don't talk it off. <laughs> it's just because I'm older, I was, I, you know, I got there first. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's really interesting, but you use sound masterfully now, you know. Is it, I mean, I know that you're a very visual person. Uh, you come at it, you know, uh, as an, an artist. Your drawings, his drawings are absolutely spectacular. I know you've published books of your drawings and so on. Um, it, it all starts with the art with you. And I'm wondering, uh, Scott, I think you started in, in sorry, uh, no, Guy, you started in uh, comics, um, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And that must have been the thing that drew you guys together, right? Because yeah. Dan was a comics freak. Yep. Yeah, and, and he called me one day while I was struggling in comics for way too long and offered me to work on, I think it was Mountains of Madness. It might have been The Hobbit first, but that didn't happen. And I went to Mountains and I, I ran out the comics door and <laughs> never came back because this world building and design work and this collaboration I've had with them for all those years was always so inspiring. The one time Guillermo and I officially worked together was uh, the, the production in the in the ill-fated Ill pre-production of Mountains of Madness. And I remember the art was just up around the rooms and the sculptures and everything. And you had gathered a stable of literally your favorite artists. Yeah, the, and uh, uh, that's what we do. Every time we start with a, what I call the submarine, which is four or five artists that we know each other very, very well before anyone shows up, we do a pass at the art and that prepares the world. But uh, one thing that I, that I know you know, because we animate or did miniatures, you did miniatures, you did mud paintings, uh, you know all of that. And I think that what is important to say about stop motion is that the form of animation that is A, more intimate than any other, because there's nothing between the animator and the yeah. model. But second, and this is really important, if we're gonna raise animation from the belief that it's a genre for kids, to its reality, which is a medium to create art and film. And we're gonna raise it from there to there. We have two battles, one is content and the other one to tell, meaning raise the stories, to tell stories that are meaningful and deep. And the second one is to tell, when we move these things, we're in real sets, lighting real props, lighting beautifully designed wardrobe. We're doing everything that is done in live action. But like Ginger said to Fred, I do the same steps you do for dancing, but I do them backwards in high heels, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. So, well, that leads to the obvious question, is that what, what specifically, if you can articulate it, drew you to doing this particular film in stop motion, which you hadn't done before? Was it the, was it the idea of the, the form following the concept, which is that it was about the animation of an inanimate about object, it. and that's yeah. what the entire... It's the, the entire... It's two things. One, the fugue point of the entire design is Pinocchio. If he is not of the same world, it creates an uncanny valley in reverse. You said, because then it's an anomaly that it bothers you. And a bad Pinocchio 
in, in a movie where everything else is done another way, you immediately get jarred. Imagine it as a live action photograph. Very, 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 very difficult. The middle of it. Very, very difficult. Yeah. So the, I, the reaction of the people in the church when after two lines of dialogue they accept that he's a puppet. Yeah. That, you know. That came like, to life. Uh, that would be a very hard scene. Very to hard thing. And, and 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 second, I knew I wanted to echo Jesus on the design of Pinocchio so, with the with the nails and the wood, the naked wood and all that. And I thought, why if if the idea is this puppet is disobedient and has will and doesn't behave like a puppet, but all the rest of the people think they are not puppets. What if they are puppets too? Yeah. And and we're doing a story about a puppet that doesn't behave like a puppet in a movie made with puppets. <laughs> I thought, God damn it, let's do that. <laughs> we're all in a fucking matrix. <laughs> yes! Yes! <laughs> the family show, man. <laughs> So talk to me about the Jesus imagery, which is unmistakable. Um, that that Im imbues your work to one degree or, 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 or another. Alfonso says I'm a very Catholic filmmaker, even although I sustain that I'm lapsed, he says not that much. <laughs> but what happens is this, uh, Collodi, who created the original book, he was, uh, he was born out of two people that worked for nobility. So he was raised in a world that uh, had a, an incredibly, a conflict between the material and the spiritual. He grew up to try to be a priest. So the, his story is full of uh, Christian symbolism. Uh, Pinocchio and the whale is That's John and the whale. Yeah. yeah. And it's the book of John, the, the rebirth. Huh? Yeah. yeah. John is tightly linked to tightly the Christ to, uh, the three and, days. Right? And Pinocchio being made of wood and all that. And, and I thought, what if we make a Pinocchio that resurrects to save his father? What if we do it against the story of fathers and sons? The fascist and his son. Uh, uh, Volpe and Spazzatura, the monkey, and Jesus and his father, who had a really difficult relationship. <laughs> hey, son, <laughs> son, guess where you're going? Where, Dad? <laughs> uh, well, you're going to go to Earth. And what am I going to do there, Dad? Uh, you know, I'll tell you in 33 years. <laughs> but you're gonna... I wanted to be a surprise. <laughs> I wanted to be a surprise. The worst birthday gift ever. And that, but it was, it was this idea of Pinocchio, actually, what makes us human is choice. And it's in every one of my movies. Choice, that's the difference, that's what is the seat of the soul. And I needed the story to take Pinocchio little by little until death explains him. Yeah. Not life, life was very wanton. And he becomes real by being mortal. By, by saying, I, I want to go back yeah. and I choose mortality. And that was, you know, there was going back. There was a line I remember on your first Spider-Man screenplay that you showed me that was great. Sometimes the line is invisible until you cross it. Right. And I wanted it to be visible for Pinocchio before he crossed it. Right. So that tells him, he, he says, send me back. And she says, you do it. You do it, wooden boy. Break the rules. And I think that's told to us every goddamn day. Yeah. Every day we're given the chance to, to be real humans in every interaction in the day. And I thought that would make the story feel alive and well, and not a traditional interpretation. All right, so I'm gonna draw, yeah. Woo! That when people say, oh, you know, it's our man hours, you're paying somebody to stay a, a week in animation is one to three seconds per animator. And you're paying an animator one or two weeks to do things that don't move the plot. Animation is too fucking animated. Everything is too efficient. Yes. Everything, the rhythm is too sitcom-y. Families in animation are all zip-zap one-liners and all they're all smart and they all have this little languages with the raised eyebrow. <laughs> and I said, let's animate real human beings in doing useless little gestures so people end up, at some point in the movie, feeling about them that they're human. It's also a way we went with mechanical no, exactly. paces. Sorry, Mark. We, uh, we also we went with mechanical paces for the vast majority of the characters, because as opposed gives, to replacement. As opposed right. to replacement, because it gives the animators more control in the moment over the performance, and we could get at nuances that would be a little bit more difficult to get with replacement faces, because once you you're committed, once you're there, and it's much bigger to to go back and correct that. But this way, the animators are actually performing right there in front of the camera. And how did you deal with water? 
<laughs> well, you know, I was watching this going, those poor motherfuckers. <laughs> but water was, you know, all the elements, you know, we, we looked at the film and we went, okay, well, it doesn't make sense for us to do some things, you know, like smoke and rain and that kind of thing. Although rain, when it's interacting with the characters, we literally put little rain, raindrops on them. And, but, um, you know, things like fire, we said, okay, how would we do fire if we were going to do it for the whole movie? And we did some tests. And we went, well, this is how we would practically do it. And then we gave that to the digital artist and said, this is what fire looks like in our world. And this is what, um, you know, this is what water looks Let like. Let it inhabit a midway point between yeah. the world of... of but it wasn't, it wasn't use it. real water. I mean, if it looked too real, the puppets would look right. stupid. Right. It's, the same, it's the same, the mix couldn't sound like a mix on a live action movie. The water couldn't look like real water. It needs to look like gelatin that behaves yeah. like water. Yeah. But one thing you would appreciate, two things is, when the camera breaks the water line, the lighting is completely different. The light of the sun, the light of the, you know, the caustic yeah. light. Yeah. So you have to do the two passes for that. And the other thing, and this is, again, something important. You do this, and I've seen you do this, and it's incredibly important. If we're going to give any minimal lesson or somebody will hear it and do it, you have to do really difficult things that look throwaway. In Avatar 2, when, when he tightens the reins, right on the edge of the water. Yeah. It's incredibly difficult. But you're saying, this is real. Nobody notices, nobody says, look at that hand. But that gesture that looks throwaway. Yeah. yeah, well in a funny way, you're spending a lot of energy getting to zero. Yes. Getting to that which people yeah. can take for granted. Will never look. Yeah. So but for informing them subconsciously. Is, is the same reason Same that, with production design, right? You know, or things that are just informing subconsciously. Yeah, the, 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 the way we follow the typeface, exactly, of the period. Right. One of the things that I, we, I, I insisted very late, so we had to make them in Mexico, is I want dogs on the city. And I want them to be victims of the war, missing one leg. Because I wanted the war to exist Skinny in the periphery. Ribs showing. Yeah, because I didn't want to show the war. But I wanted to say, the war doesn't need to be there to affect you. In the same way that uh, uh, Trump destroyed the entire world and he was in the White House. You didn't have to live nearby. You know, and, and this, this is this is the thing that I, that I oh, Florida seems especially toxic. <laughs> But, but I did that on Devil's Backbone. I said the war should exist in the horizon, but it permeates all the activities in, in the side of the orphanage. You got a strong Devil's Backbone vibe from, the, yeah, from well, that part of the film. By this, the this movie, uh, when, one of the reasons it took so long to do, they, they get, I would pitch it and they would say, is it for kids? I said, no, but kids can watch it yeah. if their parents talk to them. Young kids playing with unexploded munitions. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the, the idea was, I said, this movie has to exist as a trilogy between Devil's Backbone, Pinocchio, and Ben's Labyrinth. That's the order. And, and they need to stand as, as, a, as a movie that is personal and important and artistic to a degree that is not a babysitter fucking movie where you're going to plop the creature for two hours and, and then you're going to pick it up and never going to talk about the goddamn thing. You know, this is going to be about life and death. And the kid is gonna have serious questions for you on the way to the park. Hey, why did grandma never come back and peanut the hamster? You know, you're gonna have to explain this to them. I, I do wanna well, give a shout out to our DP. Our, our, we, have, we have an incredible uh, director of photography in this film. Frank Patton. Frank Patton. And, and you know, you were talking about getting to zero. He did some things where he, he made these gobos that could move so that it could feel like clouds moving over the line, even if they were very... They were on tracks? Yeah, they were on tracks, and they were very, very uh, subtle. Mm -hmm. So we had, you know, the sets were alive yeah. in, a, in a way that, you know, miniatures normally aren't because they had this life of light moving across them. Speaking of lights moving across, I'm getting a yeah. flashing light over here that says our time is up. <laughs> and it's very frustrating for me because I have so many questions for, for Guillermo and for everyone on his creative team. But please just join me in, in giving them a big round of applause. Thank you!